far we have been looking at spray combustion uh, we try to put a uh, set up a formulation for how to do spray combustion uh, we looked at spray statistics and so on this is actually coming from droplet combustion and we also mentioned a little bit about coal combustion and uh, maybe biomass combustion and so on so essentially we have covered something about heterogeneous combustion in this uh, uh, realm we should probably just touch upon a little bit about solid propellant combustion as well so we will just uh, quickly uh, talk about this. Um, the, the reason why we are actually going through all these things in quick succession is to essentially point out as far as this course is concerned that whatever we have learnt uh, on laminar premix flames and laminar diffusion flames are actually applicable as we speak uh, pretty much uh, in the context of more complicated application oriented areas uh, except that uh, the, the situation is complicated by a lot of other things for example in sprays it is complicated by the spray statistics uh, the diameter distribution and so on in the case of solid propellant combustion we will see what, what else happens and then we will move on to turbulent combustion also to show that the basics that we have learnt will be applicable there and, and uh, how it is complicated by the turbulence and so on. So uh, in the case of solid propellant combustion what we are uh, uh, what we need to understand is essentially we have to look at two, case, two cases one is homogeneous propellants and uh, and uh, the other one is heterogeneous propellants the, the term propellant actually means that uh, both the fuel and oxidizer are actually available in solid form together and the question basically is to what is the level to which they are really mixed together so in the case of homogeneous propellants they are actually mixed up to the molecular level so fuel and oxidizer mixed at uh, molecular level here that means when uh, when you now have a uh, a source of heat that ignites it and then this, the combustion keeps going uh, uh, under steady state conditions essentially what happens is the, the solid gets heated up and it, it is thermally unstable so it decomposes um, in, into the into gas phase products the gas phase products are essentially uh, gas phase fuel molecules and oxidizer molecules which then in turn break down further to react in, in, the, in a gas phase flame and the gas phase flame releases a lot of heat that goes back to giving rise to uh, the, the condensed phase decomposition products uh, of fuel and oxidizer molecules in the gas phase. So that is how it happens as a matter of fact when we are looking at liquid droplets there are also uh, I mentioned uh, monopropellant liquid droplets okay so where you now can actually have a premix flame that is surrounding the, the, the um, monopropellant liquid droplet uh, and uh, it, it pyrolyzes the, the droplet and the droplet decomposes into gas phase fuel and oxidizer molecules that react in the gas phase flame. So a similar idea essentially prevails for homogeneous propellants example of this for ex is uh, example um, example you can think about is uh, the, the most common thing is what is called as double base double base propellants it calls double double base because it is actually a combination of uh, nitroglycerine and nitrocellulose um, so they, they are mixed together such that they actually form uh, a mixture at the molecular level. Uh, and then they will decompose into a gas phase fuel and oxidizer on the other hand so obviously uh, before we move on to heterogeneous propellants obviously what we are looking at is essentially is this should give rise to a premixed gas phase flame and uh, uh, so you can think about a premixed gas phase flame where the preheat zone now extends into the solid all right because the preheat zone essentially is where the heat conduction happens and the heat conduction now happens into the solid heats up the solid from its initial temperature up to a surface temperature that needs to be determined as part of the problem by supplying interface boundary conditions between the solid and the gas phase and, and, and in addition to that you call 
uh, you still have the same problem essentially of an eigenvalue problem which is you have to find out the, the burning rate of the solid or what is, this, what is the rate at which the surface regresses this is that is essentially similar to the way we did the gas phase flame uh, one dimensional uh, flame structure or associated analysis. In the case of heterogeneous uh, propellants essentially the fuel and oxidizer uh, or, uh, or mixed at, at a particulate level that means you typically have this is very typical it does not have to be exactly followed this way uh, but typically we have uh, a solid oxidizer uh, powder uh, which means like uh, it is typically a salt chemical salt and uh, the, the most typical one that we use is what is called as a uh, what is called as ammonium perchlorate and uh, so you can use these ammonium perchlorate salt. So it looks like the common salt particles but you can come in very various particle sizes and uh, so essentially you have these particles that are now embedded in a, in a polymeric fuel. So this is essentially starting out with a polymer that is, that is a highly viscous liquid into which you now mix things and then you set this polymer to become a solid and so the polymer the, the fuel is essentially a polymer that, is, that also acts, uh, acts as a binder that binds the particles. And you can also of course throw in uh, metal particles to act as further fuel uh, to, do the, to this entire mixture but the metal combustion actually happens outside of the combustion between the fuel and oxidizer all right. Uh, so effectively uh, the, the, the binder and the oxidizer so effectively what we are looking for is the combustion that, that propagates the uh, flame into the solid that is caused by a flame that is between the fuel and oxidizer. Uh, so, if, so this is going to actually look like now have a lot of. Uh, um, solid particles so typically these are like about 200 microns to 300 microns in size the finer ones could be as fine as even 5 microns or even 1 micron in very extreme cases but uh, typically it is of the order of about 50 to 70 microns 80 microns uh, maybe up at the most 100 microns and so on. Uh, so essentially you try to have a very tight pack of uh, a lot of large solid particles uh, and then you now try to pack further in between the crevices. Uh, uh, of uh, form, formed in between these sub big, big solid particles with further smaller particles and so now you get these particles and then you now have a binder that is binding the whole thing uh, together. So microscopically when you now have a flame that is trying to eat into this it is obviously not going to be a premix flame right. So even at the microscopic level what happens is let us suppose that we can, we can, we can hypothetically say we just cut it with a surface like this and uh, 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 we now say that is now the burning surface obviously the burning surface is not going to be as flat as what it is and we will try to see what happens uh, how the non-planarity develops as we, as we speak but let us suppose that this is what we want to think about and now you have like an exposed area of oxidizer that is giving rise to oxidizer vapor and uh, there is exposed area of binder that is giving rise to uh, binder so this is actually uh, let us say uh, fuel here oxidizer here fuel here. And uh, this is if you now look at it like this within this region that is sort of like the inverse of the Berkshuman problem. The Berkshuman problem is where we now had a, a, a fuel in the core and oxidizer in the sides but if you did not really care about exactly what chemicals that are, that are being used we are essentially looking at two different constituents reactant, uh, reactant species that are coming out in this fashion. So we expect to actually have a, a diffusion flame. Uh, uh, over here that is associated with this recall we had talked about flux boundary conditions so we, we can we can uh, deliberately talk about where exactly the stoichiometric surface is going to attach is it going to be at the contact between the oxidizer and fuel or away these kinds of uh, uh, issues uh, are remain to remain to be discussed in these in, in these problems but we also talked when we talked about uh, um, um, diffusion flames we, we talked about finite chemi chemistry effects particularly near the uh, leading edge and then we found that we need to have something like a leading edge flame or a triple flame structure and that is pretty much expected in these propellants because it turns out that uh, the, the oxidizer actually is a monopropellant by itself it can burn by itself but we need the binder to hold the oxidizer particles together and, the, uh, and push it closer to a stoichiometric situation. Uh, therefore uh, you are essentially having a oxidizer rich uh, reactive mixture 
and in fact it can also go through a self deflagration. So you do have a, a self deflagration flame of the uh, uh, oxidizer very close to the um, oxidizer particle out of which you now get oxidizer rich products of this flame which now mix with the, uh, the, the binder fuel gaseous uh, uh, species and then obviously since you now have uh, a, a oxidizer rich species you are now going to have more like a, a triple flame rather than, um, rather than a diffusion flame that, that extends all the way. So typically modelers have identified that you now have like a, a monopropellant flame for the ammonium perchlorate then you have what is called as a primary flame uh, in the diffusion flame uh, that, that is coming from the, the triple flame kind of uh, idea uh, there the, the, the corners and then the trailing diffusion flame. So a, a typical idea of multiple flames uh, prevails for um, uh, compo what is called as composite propellants, heterogeneous propellants are also uh, generally termed as composite propellants because it is the composite of uh, uh, particulates in a, in a binder similar to composite materials and structures. Um, and uh, the, the popular idea is you, you have essentially multiple flames of different structure uh, that, that prevails on top and of course as I said uh, you, you also have aluminum metal particles that are embedded, aluminum is thermally very stable therefore uh, as it comes out it is going to accumulate on the burning surface because it is, it is just barely getting uh, melted there at that, at, that, at that time it is not uh, ready to actually get evaporated. So it, it and then so as it gets accumulated it now forms a sintered web and it is getting heated up by this, this gas phase flame complex and ultimately it, it now reaches an ignition temperature by which it gets ignited and then it ro this is a sintered web actually rolls out and then goes up and then starts burning as a bigger agglomerate than the individual uh, particles that we originally had. So that is that is a complex problem that has a lot of ramifications in solid rocket performance where these kinds of propellants are used. So all I want to point out is we have discussed many of these issues in, in, in uh, trying to do laminar flames earlier on and all these ideas actually remain uh, here as well. So we now want to also do a similar kind of uh, um, overview of uh, turbulent combustion. And uh, to say that we want to just give an overview of turbulent combustion is uh, extremely unfair because this is a subject that has actually spawned a huge amount of literature. A lot of scientists have been working and turbulent combustion is one of the things that, uh, uh, that has uh, funded a lot of combustion research if you will uh, in the last uh, many decades. Um, that is primarily because most of practical combustion barring let us say some of these things that we talk about which are happening in very very microscopic scales so that the Reynolds numbers are so small uh, except for this uh, most of the other kinds of combustion situations are turbulent, turbulent in nature right. So we are, we are, we are looking at let us say uh, gas turbine combustors or liquid rocket combustors or, uh, or furnaces um, um, or, or boilers and so on many of these things yeah, you are actually wherever you are going through most, most combustion situations uh, you, you have turbulent flow. So effectively what, what you have to do is uh, here again just like how we did sprays first we have to get a hang of turbulent flows before we can actually get into the combustion. So when we, when we did sprays you remember you, we, we uh, had to first talk about spray statistics how do you characterize sprays how do you describe sprays and then we will worry about the combustion. Uh, so similarly we have to actually go back a little bit and then give a, get a quick overview of uh, uh, what is what is turbulent about turbulent combustion right so that means we have to look at what is turbulence in general uh, we will we will try to restrict what what we are trying to do here to the context of um, turbulent jet flames and uh, when I say turbulent jet flames I will talk about both premix flames and non premix flames and let us see what what that means. So when we say turbulent jet flames so consider turbulent jet flames is what we want to do this is this is very very generic uh, because what you can think about essentially is if you now have a little nozzle from which you now have a gas that is coming out at turbulent speeds um, and, and you now issues out like a, like, like a jet right. So and then you have a lot of eddies here and there and so on it is a caricature that I do not want to really elaborate too much. So, uh, so you now have a large turbulent jet. 
Uh, so you can think about this as like, like coming out of a burner that is fitted to a combustor or a furnace and so on. So this, this is a very practical uh, situation that, come, that they come across in many applications. Uh, when you now say turbulent um, premix flames you could now think about a reactant mixture that is coming out of here and then letting in air from the sides entering into the jet. Uh, so or if you want to think about a turbulent non premix flame you could now say I have only fuel coming, coming through this it is it's entraining air around and then you now have a flame. So e either way so depending upon how, how that is going to happen right. So if, if you now have um, uh, a, a premixed, premixed reactants you are now going to have a highly wrinkled a premixed flame that is going to burn and consume all the uh, all the reactants within a very very short distance and uh, uh, once again recall so, or, or uh, if you now have or or okay or if you now have only fuel right you are now going to have a, a diffusion flame the, the, the picture that I am drawing there is essentially something like the stoichiometric surface. So what you are essentially just like how we did the Berkshman problem if it is possible for you to actually now mark the mixture fraction corresponding to the, 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 uh, the contour corresponding to the stoichiometric mixture fraction right you now get a turbulent flame and what is turbulent about it because you now have fluctuations that keep happening the next snapshot that you draw, try to uh, go through you are now not going to exactly follow the same contour this is an instantaneous picture. So the next next one is going to be slightly different and, and the third one is going to be slightly different then you keep on taking these snapshots and then put on top of each other you now get lots of these kinds of curves which, which you now kind of form a, a band and that is what you would call as a turbulent flame brush okay. So it essentially causes a brush like structure uh, on, a, on an ensemble averaged uh, manner. Similarly for the premix flame you again let us go back and think about what happens in a laminar situation we talked very significantly about the Bunsen burner experiment where uh, you, you could now have the hole at the bottom that allows for the air entrainment open and set up a premix flame and then start closing the, the hole very gradually and then convert this premix flame into a diffusion flame and we now find that the diffusion flame is a lot taller when compared to the premix flame right a very similar situation would exist for uh, for turbulent flames as well simply because in the case of diffusion flames the the, the combustion is actually diffusion controlled uh, where so the, the heat release is not going to be as intense or the chemical reactions are not going to be as intense because they are waiting for the mixing to happen right whereas in the premix flame you do not have that kind of a constraint so the heat release is kinetically controlled and so you now have a lot of heat release that happens within a very short region. So the volumetric heating load that you come out, come out with a premix flame is lot uh, higher when compared to that of a diffusion flame for this reason for the same kind of uh, thermal loading that means the amount of fuel that you are trying to burn at a particular rate your, your premix flames are typically very compact when compared to diffusion flames this is true in as well in laminar as in a turbulent flows. So if you are now thinking if you want to think about how so. Uh, just, just like how I said you know you, you, you can now look at the stoichiometric surface for the diffusion flame I also meant to point out you could now think about a local turbulent flame speed that is trying to match the, 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 the flow and then trying to set itself up right and there we have a little problem you know am, am I going to actually say this instantaneous flame is the one that is traveling at a turbulent flame speed or is it like a a turbulent premix flame brush that is traveling at a turbulent flame speed. So that the notion of what is a turbulent flame speed uh, is a little bit difficult to think about and we will have to talk about it a little bit in, in, in greater detail uh, shortly maybe. Uh, the first thing that, that I am hinting is first of all for if, if you are completely ignorant we will now have to talk about something called a turbulent flame speed as opposed to a laminar flame speed. We got a hint of it the moment we actually used SL where L is a subscript indicating laminar and I pointed out that when we do when we think about turbulent flames we will have to alter that um, and, and so we will we'll discuss this. Uh, the point again I am trying to make is the ideas that we had like the flame, flame speed balances the, flow, the normal component of the flow those ideas will remain okay that, that is not going to change. So if you want to now think about all these things the first thing that we have to do is forget about the flames for a moment 
we will now look at only the term turbulent jet right so for, for the sake of looking at the turbulent jet let us not worry about whether this is premixed reactants or, or uh, a fuel we will simply say it is just a jet of some gas right maybe air itself and uh, uh, in an acquiescent air ambience that means you are essentially looking at a, a, a jet and in the jet you now have uh, a region that is like where you have an unsteady shear layer where you, you, you now have two mixing layers we are talking about momentum mixing as well as species mixing and thermal mixing if, they, if, if, if it is not isothermal. Uh, so all these things are happening within this region in an unsteady manner. You could uh, hope to actually view this part as essentially an unsteady laminar case if you are if you're trying to resolve these scales in your, in your computation or whatever it is. Uh, but pretty quickly you are now going to get into a region where you transition to uh, turbulence. Right, and then beyond this point, you now have a fully developed turbulent jet. When you are now having a fully developed turbulent jet, uh, we are now looking at a lot of uh, eddies over here, uh, which, are, which, are, which are primarily uh, homogeneous isotropic. So, we are looking at situation where if you now pick a point uh, which is given by x and another point which is given by x plus r uh, distant, uh, distant r apart uh, then we, we now characterize this by uh, having a cross correlation uh, between the two. Uh, now uh, if you are now looking at this region where it is fully developed turbulence uh, for a homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Uh, the location x uh, does not matter, location, location x is arbitrary, arbitrary and, uh, and all you are looking at is essentially the, the actual distance rather than the displacement. So that, that means you do not have to look at this in a vector, vector form, uh, it, so the direction did not matter because it is isotropic. So uh, the, the location did not matter because it is homogeneous therefore uh, uh, and uh, or can be replaced by mod r which was let us say simply r without the vector um, and then what you are looking for is a velocity correlation. So the starting point of thinking about turbulent flows is to, to think about a velocity correlation uh, here uh, that is a spatial correlation that means you are essentially looking at turbulent fluctuation at uh, x comma t uh, correlated with the turbulent fluctuation um, at x plus r comma t as a as an average right and then uh, the the then you normalize this so the normalized normalized correlation f of r comma t then is uh, just take the uh, correlation r and uh, divided by the RMS so u prime squared t the whole bar and uh, so why are we why are we bothered about this because we want to now step into how this looks like uh, so if you now look at how the f uh, of r comma t looks like uh, then it is going to be uh, versus r let us say. So how does it look like versus r uh, it typically goes uh, it is it is normalized so we do not have to worry about the magnitude it goes asymptotically to 0 as you go further out in r and uh, with respect to this we could now say somewhere along here we have a length scale eta which we would now call as the Kolmogorov length scale and uh, somewhere in here we would now have a length scale L which we would call as the integral length scale. We will talk about these things uh, a little bit more uh, carefully so let us not worry about them at the moment or trying to write down uh, but what we are what I am interested in is 
if I can actually have a function that approximates this to good measure and uh, that would be 1 minus uh, 3 fourths C over K epsilon R to the 2 thirds um, where K what we are talking about is uh, K is what is called as the turbulent kinetic energy. turbulent kinetic energy um, which is uh, equal to for isotropic turbulence you can say this is equal to u prime uh, 3 halves u prime squared where u prime of course is the fluctuation uh, over the mean uh, of, of the velocity and epsilon is the uh, dissipation and uh, and C of course is uh, what is called as the Kolmogorov constant Kolmogorov constant and uh, then we want to talk about what is the integral length scale. Integral length scale L of t then is uh, integral 0 to infinity f of r comma t dr that is essentially the normalized correlation integrated over all uh, all distance and then you now get a measure of a, a a scale that kind of caps the lot scale lot scale structures so uh, and we will see what that means uh, pretty soon and, and, and then you now have what is called as the Kolmogorov length scale which is uh, the, the smallest length scale uh, in your flow essentially what is happening is you now have a turbulent flow in which you now have a cascading that happens uh, that, that goes all the way down to the, the Kolmogorov length scale. So eta is uh, nu cube divided by epsilon the, the whole to the 1 4 where nu is the kinematic viscosity and of course epsilon is what we call as the uh, turbulent dissipation sometime back all right. Uh, we will also talk about a, 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 a um, Kolmogorov time associated with the length scale and uh, we, we will talk about these time scales and length scales and, and the velocity associated with these uh, for many of these scales uh, but at the moment we are dis discussing the Kolmogorov uh, scale. So the Kolmogorov time T eta is uh, nu over epsilon to the half and uh, Kolmogorov velocity Kolmogorov velocity Vn is uh, nu epsilon to the uh, one fourth, right? And between uh, between the large scale and uh, the the Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov scale, we could now think about a discrete sequence of eddies. Uh, and uh, we, we the reason why we are talking about these things is because ultimately we want to compare these things with a laminar flame thickness. Okay. So when you now talk about combustion. We now have length scales associated, uh, length scales and time scales associated with the flame and the and the and the flame speed that's associated with it. So we want to be able to compare these scales with the, the those of, those of the flame. So uh, we we now talk about a discrete sequence of uh, eddies. Discrete sequence of eddies. Um, within what is called as a uh, inertial sub range I am going to explain this soon with a, with a spectrum with the energy spectrum but uh, let us first I mean it is kind of like a um, chicken and egg thing. So we first have to talk about the cascade and then the uh, spectrum or vice versa. Uh, so, so this is basically L divided by 2 to the n where um, of course until we reach eta where n goes as 1 2 etcetera 
that means for every eddy size it is half the size as the previous the, the bigger eddy essentially that is how we keep on looking at a discrete sequence and uh, what we can find out when, when in this in this inertial sub range essentially the dissipation remains constant you have a constant dissipation mechanism that, that works on the, 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 these eddies therefore we could now say that epsilon is uh, uh, essentially like uh, V n squared divided by T n where V n is actually the velocity associated with the nth eddy and the T n is the time associated with the tenth, tenth, nth, nth eddy and uh, this would be this would be the same as V eta squared by T eta. Uh, where, where, where eta and t eta are essentially the Kolmogorov uh, scales. So, then the next thing that we want to think about is what is called as a wave number. For some reason, uh, turbulent the turbulence community uh, is very fond of K, maybe because. Uh, Kolmogorov they, they, they like Kolmogorov a lot so they keep using K for uh, the, the turbulent kinetic energy as well as the wave number uh, and so on so, uh, so this is typically like 1 over, uh, 1 over the length scale and uh, what we are looking for is uh, the energy density which is the kinetic energy density. density per unit wave number k. So, we can now think about a spectrum right E of k uh, versus uh, k and uh, usually we are looking at a, a spectrum that kind of looks like uh, looks, looks like this. And you can now think about uh, uh, a, a division here where you are looking at uh, this is the large scale, this is the large scale and uh, this corresponds to uh, 1 over L which is the integral length scale and uh, this corresponds to uh, 1 over eta the Kolmogorov length scale and uh, we are looking at this region as the energy containing eddies or energy containing you can say integral scales and uh, this region is now referred to as the inertial sub range where you now have a constant slope of minus 5 third that is a famous law there and then below the uh, Kolmogorov length scale is the viscous sub range. So, essentially what is going on is turbulent flows are of such high Reynolds numbers on the whole uh, based on the uh, large scale that uh, um, you have a predominant inertial effect over the viscous effect as you keep on going down further and further to smaller and smaller scales until you reach the Kolmogorov scale beyond which the viscous effects begin to be important right. So, <coughs> this is this is how this thing uh, pans out. So, it is kind of like a 10 15 minutes of uh, turbulence or less, less than that maybe, right. Uh, just about enough to for us to think a little bit about what happens when you now throw in a flame on top of this right. So, we, if we and then we want what we want to do is to think about premixed uh, premixed turbulent combustion right. Now, the first thing that I would like to point out as a as an empirical fact or, a, or, a, or, a, or an observation is when you now have a turbulent flame it now propagates a lot faster than a laminar flame corresponding laminar flame. How do I get there right how did I how did I get to that point essentially what it means is now you have a lot of these eddies in the flow 
that are trying to wrinkle or corrugate this flame and you now have on the whole a flame that looks thicker and wants to reach ahead of itself. So it is like a very, very uh, crude way of thinking about this and then we have to think a little bit more refined manner. Uh, but effectively it now gives rise to a larger uh, flame speed when compared to the laminar flame. And uh, if you now thought that the laminar flame speed under typical uh, conditions or of the order of a few tens of centimeters per second, uh, the, the turbulent flame speed or speed speeds are about an order, order magnitude more. So they actually are in the range of meters per second, right. Uh, still quite smaller when compared to m most of the flow speeds that occur in uh, let us say, let us say a gas turbine engine. So if you now think about a gas turbine uh, engine where uh, you are still looking at subsonic flows, we are not talking about supersonic combustion uh, here. Uh, maybe not in this course, uh, 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 we, are, we are looking at subsonic flows highly uh, subsonic, we went through this long ago when we wanted to show that the pressure remains more or less constant in, in uh, low uh, Mach number conditions uh, and we said that the Mach number is of the order of about 0.1 and uh, since the temperatures are pretty high in the combustion zone, uh, your speed of sound could be like of the order of uh, 1000 meters per second for the kind of temperatures that we, we are looking at and so we are looking at uh, flow velocities are of the order of uh, a, uh, several many or many tens of meters per second to 100 meters per second that kind of 100 that, that, that is the kind of speeds we are talking about as opposed to which the, the turbulent flame speeds are still <coughs> quite low right. Uh, and, and this is obviously nothing, nothing to do with uh, detonation speeds. Okay, and, and they are like about three orders magnitude uh, apart. Um, so you can now, you now have to think about the uh, the ideas that we had about flame shapes that are get, uh, uh, that are attained. Like for example, if you had like bluff body V gutters, the flame still with the turbulent flame propagation, it still tries to align itself at an angle to the flow such that the component of the flow velocity will match this flame speed. So what you are talking about as a flame speed is this uh, flame speed here is kind of like a time averaged uh, flame speed. So what happens in reality without, without uh, having to average right. So for which what we want to do here is to actually look at the physics of what is going on instead of thinking about like let us say empirical correlations on how the turbulent uh, mm, flame speed uh, varies, uh, varies relative to laminar flame speed and so on. That is for maybe a, a special course on turbulent combustion itself where you get quantitative about it. But here we just want to qualitatively look at the different regimes of uh, turbulent flows. Right. So the, the, the idea of uh, turbulent flame regimes uh, comes from several investigators in the late 80s. Uh, so the, 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 the first of which uh, is Borgi 1985, in fact uh, the early researchers used to call this regime diagram as the Borgi diagram, uh, but it has been uh, also put forward by Peters and refined further uh, and uh, Bradley and co-workers, it is like 1989. Uh, Ponsor et al. Many of these people are still active researchers uh, in, in the community and uh, so you can see that this is not very, very old. Uh, it is about only about 20 years um, old idea. Uh, so what we want to do here is to assume a unity Schmidt number. That means we do not want to make a big distinction between viscous uh, mixing and uh, um, molecular mixing uh, SC which is nu over D we will now take this as 1 and uh, we now go through a few definitions here. So def define our flame thickness, flame thickness LF capital F refers to flame uh, not fuel and we will stick to this when we are when we are doing diffusion flames as well uh, equal to D over SL and you are using SL you see 
and that means we are actually thinking about essentially a laminar flame that is going through a fate of uh, wrinkling and so on uh, um, when it is subjected to the turbulent eddies right and then we want to now construct a, 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 an idea of what a turbulent flame looks like from essentially what is a laminar flame right. So we are using a laminar flame speed and then you have a flame time which is uh, Tf equals d over SL squared let us see order of magnitude expression that you would get there. Um, so we want to define a turbulent Reynolds number turbulent Reynolds number uh, which is defined as uh, um, Re equal to let us say V prime uh, L over nu where V prime is uh, the turbulent intensity it is a measure of uh, the, the fluctuation right the, the, the turbulent velocity fluctuation it comes from how you can define your kinetic energy that means you can you can say uh, you are looking at something like this under square root that means uh, this is basically uh, two thirds k um, power, power half okay so that is that is how the turbulent intensity comes from uh, and L is of course the integral length scale uh, and uh, nu is uh, the viscosity and uh, therefore since we are using Schmidt number equal to 1 we say this is actually V prime divided by V prime L divided by D and uh, we just define the flame thickness as LF equals D over SL so D uh, is LF SL so this is going to look like uh, V prime L over SL LF it is sort of like uh, a velocity uh, ratio times the length scale ratio right. So the velocity ratio here, here is we are comparing the turbulent intensity versus the flame speed we are comparing the integral length scale of the turbulent eddies uh, with the flame thickness right. So I am trying to sort of implant this idea right here because that is kind of the way we are going to think about this. Uh, the next thing that we want to think about is a turbulent Dam Kohler number Dam Kohler number uh, is something that we have uh, come across earlier on uh, which is essentially a, a flow time by reaction time so it compares uh, your flow time scale by the reaction time scale and uh, so typically it is quite large because uh, it takes a lot of time for the flow to make a significant movement like over a characteristic length scale of the geometry when compared to the time it takes for the reactions to happen. So uh, uh, Dam Kohler number is now defined based on this but you know you will find that it is a little bit different from the, the, the way Reynolds number turns out to be this is essentially uh, time scales right. So this is actually S SLL divided by V prime LF so it is actually coming from um, L over V prime for the flow time uh, divided by LF over SL for the uh, chemical time. So, uh, so it is sort of like saying uh, this, this, this looks like this and this looks like that they, they kind of look very, very closely similar but, but then they are not right. Uh, so keep in mind do not get, don't, don't get confused about this and uh, we now have a Karlovitz number. Ka, uh, so Dam Kohler number as the symbol Da, Karlovitz number has a symbol Ka, uh, which is uh, effectively Tf, the flame time divided by the uh, turbulence time. So this is uh, you, you can, or you can say, uh, uh, you can say Lf squared divided by eta squared in terms of length scales or you can say Vn uh, mm, Vn squared 
or V eta squared sorry V eta squared divided by SL squared whichever way you want to uh, say this is essentially in all these cases we are looking at basically ratio of flame scales to Kolmogorov scale flame scale to total flame okay you can say flame scales because it could be time scale length scale whatever Kolmogorov scales right and uh, with these we should be able to show Ka uh, sorry Re equal to uh, D A squared K A squared. So that kind of sounds like uh, Daka is equal to square root of R E. So that's that, that's some way by which you could remember. Um, now, what we what we have been thinking about a laminar flame is pretty much the same as what we thought earlier, which means it has a preheat zone and a reaction zone, right? And then the preheat uh, largely. Uh, the flame thickness is mostly preheat zone for a typically a high damp cold number or a high activation energy situation your reaction zone thickness is quite small when compared to the, um, the, the, the flame thickness itself and it is given by what is called as a Zeldovich number right or the Zeldovich the scaling. So you can scale this scale the um, uh, flame thickness by the Zeldovich number in order to get you get the reaction zone thickness we have done this uh, earlier when we were when we were talking about laminar. Uh, flames. So we can now form a second uh, Karlovitz number based on the reaction zone thickness alone. The reason why we are thinking about this is first of all recall we had we, we were talking about these things as well as the, the, the uh, turbulence length scales because we want to now begin to compare how the turbulent length scales are going to be relative to the flame thickness right and what you are thinking about is and you now keep on changing your regime you are now going to have a situation where the turbulent length scales are typically much larger when compared to the flame thickness but as you now keep on changing the regime you now get into a situation where the turbulent scales are going to be small small enough to be able to enter into the preheat zone but not the reaction zone right and then ultimately can we get it to be even smaller than the reaction zone and so on. So this is how we want to go through so therefore we also want to keep a track of the reaction zone thickness alone rather than just the flame thickness on the whole. So um, for uh, reaction zone thickness reaction zone thickness L delta uh, in the in the premix, premix flame a, a second Karlovitz number. K A subscript delta can be defined as L delta square divided by eta. We are still comparing this with the Kolmogorov length scale, and of course we can show that this is equal to delta square K A, where delta square uh, is essentially the Zeldovich scaling coming between the flame length and uh, the flame thickness and the reaction zone thickness L delta. Uh, we will just stop today with showing or this is probably a good time to stop we think we finish these definitions we will pick up from here tomorrow.